parks as forests and while supporting our local economy and achieving our net zero emissions by 2050. So with that, I again welcome you and I want to turn that uh, turn this meeting over to Han to start us off with her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Undersecretary Cheng, and I apologize uh, for starting the recording a little late. All right. Oh, come on. Trying to advance the slide. Okay. All right. Uh, so before we go into the depth of the presentation, just want to provide some quick refreshers. Um, we had a meeting in December talking about the main framing strategies for the clean energy and climate plan. Um, those are the protect natural working land strategy, manage natural working lands, restore natural working lands. The next one is incentivize carbon storage in durable wood products. And then the last one is to explore additional carbon sequestration to achieve net zero by 2050. Uh, we went into detail in that meeting um, on the reason why we, we have these uh, strategies here. And um, as Undersecretary Cheng uh, mentioned at the last meeting in January, um, Assistant Secretary Kurt Geithner talked about the recent Lance Initiative. And so I just wanted to provide a brief, a brief refresher on what those are here listed here, options for the protect strategy, options for the manage strategy and options for restore. Um, I won't go over them in detail because um, Assistant Secretary uh, Geithner provide um, quite a bit of detail on it at the last meeting and you can go on our website to see the recording of that meeting. But just wanted to bring it up here for uh, a quick refresher. And so um, in addition to the Resit Lands Initiative, the key elements of it that are informing the clean energy and climate plan for 2025 uh, and 2030, we also have um, been working with our global warming solutions act program um program um global warming solutions act uh implementation um advisory committee on policies to include in the clean energy and climate plan and they provided a list of strategies um recommendations policy priorities for us to consider once um reviewing those policy recommendations uh, we want to highlight one that hasn't been covered yet by the Resilient Lands Initiative, which is here is to, is to further protect forest in all geogra uh, geographies by um, adding tree removal as a mandatory threshold under the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act um, uh, Office's environmental impact review process. Um, and so this is something that we really want to hear back from you all on whether or not this is um, a policy for us to uh, push forward and pursue for the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. Um, we, it will be, um, if we're to pursue it, it will be undergoing um, the regulatory process as part of the MEPA uh, review this uh, summer. Uh, another thing is that um, in addition to the uh, suggestion from the IAC, um, as well as the policy recommendations um, in the Resilient Lands Initiative, we put in the um, interim plan for, clean, for 2030 that uh, EEA and DOER will uh, lead a planning effort for um, understanding where ground mount solar siting could happen to ensure both um, land management practices that protect critical um, species and, and ecosystems in Massachusetts, but then also reducing the carbon um, impact and the um, improving the uh, cost. And so I'm going to turn it over to Eric Seltzer, who will provide more information about the study that has been done um, to date, as well as the future plans for additional analysis. Great, thanks so much, Han. Uh, really appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak before you and, and the public about uh, some of our efforts that we're looking at undertaking now in 2022 on the technical potential of solar study. Next slide.
Uh, first, I thought it'd be good to give a baseline of what we have done to date. Uh, and uh, many of you may be familiar with this, but in early 2021, Massachusetts issued out um, a solar siding analysis uh, that we had under had had done in in conjunction with MassGIS. Um, it was a spatial analysis exercise with some very high resolution data that was flown in April of 2019, and it uh, basically did an assessment of ground-mounted solar systems in Massachusetts and how much acreage had been developed, uh, and then characterized the land that had been replaced by the solar systems. There had been a number of other studies that had been done uh, to date, but there had been nothing from uh, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And, and so we thought it would be a good exercise to undertake ourselves, especially given the high resolution data that we had. The intent of the, the analysis wasn't just to create you know, the, a baseline assessment of where we're at, but really to also create a methodology that could be easily duplicated in future years. So as we're progressing along uh, to meet our ambitions for clean energy, we can constantly be doing an assessment of where we're standing and how uh, it is impacting the landscape too. The results showed that there was approximately uh, 8,000 acres uh, worth of land that had been converted over into uh, solar and uh, a good chunk of that had been, approximately 50% of it had been forest. Um, and then there's other areas that are previously developed, which includes uh, landfills or brownfields uh, that, that isn't to be interpreted to include building mounted systems as our program. Um, and this, this methodology really focused solely on ground mounted systems. Next slide. The analysis and all the data behind it, including the methodology that we undertook, is all available on MassGIS website. Uh, for those that don't um, have familiarity with GIS and working within geodatabases, we did create an online mapping tool. Uh, and this is a snapshot of one region in Oxford area. Uh, where it, it, it gives you an impression of the type of analysis that we undertook really identifying specific at a parcel level basis, identifying specific areas that were developed for solar. And this included not just the footprint of the array itself, but it, it included uh, a, an exercise where we went out to the tree line, to the fence line. Uh, so we are incorporating all acreage that's associated with it. So uh, really encourage folks uh, to take a look at that information um, from that website. Next slide. So that leads us into some of the work that we're looking at undertaking now in 2022. And, and to just set the this, this, this stage for it as well, we've undertaken that solar siting analysis, which we've described. But um, in addition to that, our interim CECP is calling for an additional two gigawatts of distributed generation resources. We anticipate that that uh, is largely going to be solar and that that uh, is really aimed between the years of 2026 to 2030. Uh, for development. And then our decarbonization roadmap that was also issued out in uh, uh, December of 2020 called for up to 20 gigawatts worth of uh, solar sited specifically in Massachusetts in order to meet our ambitions that we need to meet the net zero goals. Um, that uh, a good chunk of that is going to be ground mounted uh, as anticipated through the modeling. And so we really want to start the exercise knowing that we need to have this clean energy in order to meet our goals. So what can we do to start uh, furthering the conversation about the siting of solar within Massachusetts? And that's really uh, uh, the groundwork and the foundation for what we're hoping to accomplish now in 2022. And so the technical potential of solar studies objectives are to, to, to build off of the baseline that we we've done, identify preferred locations and the barriers to development uh, for those, and really to also take a look at the potential solutions and the policy considerations to that. We want to ensure that we're taking adequate account for the environmental factors that are associated to siting of solar, and that includes the ecosystem services of the land, uh, the carbon sequestration potential, the wildlife values that they provide, the recreation benefits that our resources provide, 
but we also need to take into account some of the cost factors that are associated with it. In particular, we're really uh, interested to explore further about the hosting capacity of our distribution system and where we might be able to uh, uh, have targeted developments that could be at a lower cost to, to ratepayers. The process that we're anticipating is gonna be very uh, uh, robust uh, stakeholder engagement. Um, we're gonna need that in order to really help to uh, structure the methodology. So there'll be more uh, engagement coming on this. And then the final product, um, this is something that I've uh, personally been really interested in seeing, which is to make sure that the product is uh, accessible to all. Um, and so it's not just a, a written report, but you know, really wanting to have a resource that can be accessed by everybody and understood by everyone as well. Next slide. There, we're fortunate here in Massachusetts that uh, we're not the first ones to undertake similar uh, endeavors. Um, here's a list uh, of, of uh, some studies and analyses that we're uh, aware of that have been undertaken. Um, uh, New Jersey, Rhode Island, California um, have all undertaken different areas on that, uh, also up in Maine. And so as we've been working on developing uh, the scope for this study, which is still in its preliminary stages, we've really been looking at some of these resources and studies that have been done elsewhere um, to help inform some of the direction that we're looking at going. Next slide. In particular, I wanted to give a little bit of a call out to the Cape Cod Commission here in Massachusetts for their work that they've done with uh, uh, their solar screening tool. Um, as far as what I've envisioned for the technical potential of study, uh, solar study, I think this is a good uh, example of the, the type of direction that we're looking at going. Um, in particular, it's, it's uh, their analysis and their solar sighting, screening tool that they did is parcel based as opposed to some of the other studies that have been done. Um, and that is certainly the intent that um, I'm looking to go with this study. Uh, and they did do some thematic ranking uh, of preferred locations and least preferred locations. Um, and they also have uh, areas that they just know straight from the get-go that uh, uh, isn't an area or isn't a type of resource where we would want to be uh, uh, encouraging the siting of solar. And so uh, I think if, if you're not familiar with this tool, I'd really encourage folks to take a look at it. Um, you know, it, again, we're, we're, this is a good foundation for it. I think uh, our direction of methodology and objectives for the study uh, could be different, and it's going to be informed through stakeholder uh, input as we progress with the process. Next slide. Uh, as far as the key components of the solar study, as I mentioned, number one is going to be public engagement. Uh, we're going to be uh, going out to procure consultants to help support us. We're going to be seeking um, a, a stakeholder engagement plan from each of these consultants. Um, I, I anticipate that it's going to be multiple rounds of focus group sessions, in-person, virtual sessions uh, um, um, to help inform the direction of this study. And, and then the second piece of it, and really the heart of the, the study, is going to be the spatial analysis that we're uh, going to be undertaking, which will uh, be doing uh, a similar ranking structure to where are the preferred locations for solar um, that we're looking at here in Massachusetts, but also really showing at a high level the real potential for solar here in Massachusetts as well. I anticipate that spatial analysis that we might do some niche uh, areas to further assess into. We know that there's a, a great deal of interest and, and passion behind uh, the opportunities and challenges to dual agricultural solar projects, as well as uh, floating solar uh, options. And so we may do some niche areas to look and further assess about those specific markets as well. Third is a GHG analysis. Um, this is something that we have been looking at uh, uh, for, for some time, and a number of uh, the solar projects that do trigger MEPA review um, might be providing information about their GHG 
analysis of the solar array compared to the carbon uh, sequestration potential on that landscape. But to date, there hasn't been anything done, um, um, at least that I'm aware of, that, that, that really shows the GHE analysis from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts perspective. And so I'd, I, I anticipate that this study would do an assessment of the uh, potential uh, carbon sequestration uh, for the forested landscape, and then also comparing it against the uh, clean energy that could be uh, uh, derived from the solar systems as well. Uh, the, the next piece is on our policy considerations, and, and the spatial analysis will be really helpful to conceptualize this, but we also want to have uh, and do a deeper dive into our policies that we've done to date, how effective have they been, and really what uh, sort of new policies will we need to consider, and where are the real challenges and the, the solutions to those challenges for those areas that we want to look at further. Um, um, for solar policy considerations. And then, as I mentioned earlier, the, the last and final piece is really to ensure that whatever deliverable is done here for the technical potential of solar study is, is accessible to all. And I anticipate that will be a combination of an online resource as well as a uh, report. Uh, we're very eager and interested to have uh, engagement with our environmental justice communities on this and to really look to see what we might be able to do to um, uh, uh, take in information, uh, make sure that the information is available um, to multiple different languages as well. Next slide. As far as the process goes, we're in the final stages of getting the uh, request for qualification issued out. Um, so I anticipate that going out sometime in the near future, in the winter of 2022. Um, uh, following that, we're certainly going to be reviewing the proposals that come in, and we'll need to undertake contracting with those consultants, and that can take a little bit of time. And so I anticipate that uh, uh, happening in the spring of 2022. And then uh, as far as engagement with stakeholders, I would anticipate that we'll really start this process in earnest in summer of 2022. And that uh, based off of that information that comes in from stakeholders, we can help uh, to refine the methodology of the study and then uh, issue, issue results uh, thereafter. Next slide. And I think that concludes it and uh, certainly gonna be available for questions uh, towards the tail end of the session. Thank you. Great, thank you, Eric. Um, next up in the um, meeting here, we will have a presentation by Dr. Duncan McKinley. Excuse me, sorry. I'm going back to that slide. Um, Dr. Duncan McKinley is a natural resource specialist at the Office of Sustainability and Climate, um, located at the National Forest System Branch of the US Forest Service. He has spent 20 years of natural resource he has over 20 years of natural resource science and policy experience. His area of specific expertise is in forest and grassland carbon dynamics. Dr. McKinley and his team are best known for developing a national approach for the national forest system to foster the delivery of carbon information for decision making. I'm pleased to um, have Dr. McKinley here with us. Thank you so much. Can you? Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Han, if you would like to advance the slides, we could do that so we don't have to do the handshake um, back and forth. Okay, so sure, I can do that. Feel free to go ahead and advance. That's me. I'm a little bit hairier now. Um, so I wanted to talk about, um, you know, framing around forest carbon. It's incredibly complex. Um, I've been spending 20 years studying it, and I'm still learning more. So. I wanted to focus the talk today, I thought it'd be very helpful to understand how harvested wood products fit into uh, forest carbon cycling and dynamics. So first of all, um, what is the interest in forest carbon? I'm gonna, I'm gonna talk about what is the interest in forest carbon, and then I'm gonna talk about this system that I'm mentioning that, that talks about um, how to reconcile these two very different ideas. The, the cycling that's going on in the physical forest and what's going on when carbon leaves the forest and harvested wood products. Next. So 
So why is the public interested? I'm, I'm sure that you guys are, are very familiar with this. We're concerned about the emissions of our actions. Uh, uh, the emissions are coming from our actions uh, with forestry or whatever. Um, but also in the, in the forest context, we're very interested in using management to sequester carbon and looking at strategies and approaches to reduce carbon loss where appropriate, AKA adaptation. So there's a whole slew of proposed uh, mitigation strategies or strategies um, uh, available. And uh, if you wanna read further, there's a couple of papers here that I would point you to. One is the Issues in Ecology by Ryan et al. Um, and that's a non-technical version, but if you wanna get into the, the technical version, get into the, the details and nitty gritty, I recommend the second paper. Go ahead, next slide. So when we talk about carbon mitigation strategies or thinking about the effects of our uh, ac actions on emissions, there's two major pathways. One is increased carbon stocks and sequestration in forested ecosystems. And then there's this other strategy uh, which can be um, complementary, which is increasing carbon storage and harvested wood products and the use of those products to displace the use of fossil fuels. Next slide. So, but there's a lot of confusion and um, uh, around how harvested wood products and other uh, derivatives from the forest, how they affect carbon, either um, through uh, substitution for or use for uh, harvested wood products and furniture, um, pellets for biomass energy, um, and also where does that carbon go in the landfill? It's just, it's just kind of hanging out there. What's this about? Next slide. So this is just kind of a, um, go ahead, one more. There is a, these different perspectives, or what I call two different perspectives that are, are really hard to reconcile. So this is kind of how um, I see car carbon. So carbon is a, a huge sprawling estate of, of activities and actions, and it's very, very complex, it's huge. So there's a lot of folks who come in uh, with very narrow, uh, aspects, right? They're looking at, oh, I want to see what happens with this particular tree or, or this stand, or I work on it in the bioenergy context. So it, it leads to this funny, uh, what a, this funny uh, illustration I wanted to show is that without seeing the whole, it's, you can get different conclusions about what you're actually working with. And this is what this cartoon is illustrating. Next slide. So specifically, there, to go into the detail about these competing views, there's one view which um, we kind of nickname, it's not an official term, the narrow view, which looks at the view of, looks at carbon cycling from the view of just the forested ecosystem. Then there's the other view, uh, which is what we um, kind of nicknamed the broad view, which not only looks at the carbon in the forested ecosystem, but where that carbon is going once it leaves the ecosystem in a variety of products and how those might uh, interact with the fossil fuel component um, of our emissions. So let's go into this a little bit more deeply. Next slide. So this is how most people view the forest system. So um, if you're going, if you're intending to increase carbon, you plant trees, you keep forests as forests, um, things that remove carbon, such as timber harvesting or wildfires, insects, disease, um, you know, that's considered to be a loss of carbon, right? So it, it's, this is just how that is viewed. Go ahead and next slide. But we really know that there is a lot more to the story than just what happens in the physical ecosystem. Next slide. So, to ground us in an understanding and how the forest carbon dynamics work and it ultimately explains the role of harvested wood products, let's look at a, 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 a really um, generic uh, view of how carbon plays out over the course of uh, forest development. So forests go through this boom and bust cycle when, um, when they're young, middle-aged, and when they're um, starting to age, they're, they're accruing carbon, 
but invariably a disturbance comes along. In this case, it's um, wildfire and that carbon starts to decay um, and there's a volatilization of carbon to the atmosphere. So there's a little bit of a carbon loss Well, then forest recover over time. So this is how things play out sometimes over decades, centuries or millennia, but there's this boom and bust in carbon um, as, as forests you know, grow, they mature, they die, they get replaced and, and grow again. Okay, next slide. So what I'm showing here, I don't know if you can see the, my pointer or not, but the inner circle represents that boom and, boom and bust cycle that I just mentioned. So you have forests that are, are growing, they're accruing carbon, they're storing carbon. And then there's this cycle here where uh, insects, wildfire, disease, uh, timber harvest, whatever, um, there is a, uh, a bust in the system. So that carbon gets released to the atmosphere. But what I wanted to illustrate to you here is over here on the left-hand side, um, if there is a, a timber harvest, for example, these, that carbon goes into a various different pathway. In this case here, um, it can be converted to biomass for energy or a, a portion of the, the product stream. Um, the, the products can be put into harvested wood products that, um, that we use, um, tables, furniture, lumber for houses. And one thing I, I want to point out here is that these products sometimes substitute for products that are more energy intensive. And what I mean by that is, let's say, take a, I read a paper a few years ago where there was, uh, they were comparing a, a wood floor to a vinyl floor. So the emissions that are associated with creating a vinyl floor were 20 times higher than they were for a comparable wood floor. So if you were to use wood um, in place of, uh, instead of using vinyl, you're actually having a tremendous uh, carbon emissions reduction benefit by, by choosing that. So, but what I wanna point out here is this harvested wood product cycle kind of mirrors the natural boom and bust cycle. We call this the biogenic cycle. Whereas on the right, fossil fuels, um, everything that is um, used in terms of fossil fuels, oil, coal, gas, goes into the atmosphere. There, the conditions in which these uh, were formed no longer exist on the earth. So it is a one-way pathway. It's an open system into the atmosphere. It doesn't go back to where it, uh, into the ground where it came from. Whereas forests, once they're harvested um, and they provide the product, they regrow under most circumstances. We have to consider climate change, of course, and, and other issues. Next slide. So what breaks this cycle, right, this biogenic cycle, is um, if we lose those forests. So if you have a, a forest that is um, harvested but then converted, Harvesting is very different than conversion, but converted to a different land use, like a parking lot or, um, or whatever it might be, that essentially breaks the carbon cycle. So the carbon that would normally return back to the forest ecosystem has nowhere to go. So this, in effect, has a very similar impact on emissions as fossil fuels. Next slide. So going back to this perspective thing, uh, I'm going to take you back step by step and pull these different pieces together in a, a, a coherent framing. Next slide. So this is how uh, most people view the forest system. Okay, this is the narrow view. You're just looking at the carbon coming into the system, coming out of the system through sequestration and through a, a number of actions. Next slide. But there are services used by society. We're going to need to use wood for, our, um, for products, for energy, for a whole wide variety of things. And that carbon does get stored for various lengths of time in a harvested wood products. Then there's this interaction with the fossil fuel cycle that I, I a fossil fuel pathway that I mentioned, where perhaps the wood product would have fewer emissions associated with its production than a comparable uh, product, such as concrete or steel or glass or something in, in terms of 
of, of this. So there can actually be fewer emissions associated with using harvested wood products than products that might be more energy intensive to, to develop. But one more slide. You also have to consider what's going on in the land sector. That's really important. I just mentioned that. Because if you're lose, not keeping forests as forests, then you're essentially breaking the cycle. One more, one more click. So if you're really interested in the uh, climate change and you want to under, you need to understand what the net emissions are in the atmosphere, the IPCC suggests that we not we just don't look at what's going on in the forest ecosystem but we look at how the carbon is coming off the ecosystem, the forested ecosystem, and how it's used by society, as well as land use change. So this is the holistic view, the appropriate scientific view to figure out what the impacts of our actions or mitigation strategies are on what we do care about is the CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. Next slide. So I'm gonna, Put this into um, some uh, uh, this this contextual into kind of an, uh, an example here. So these are these two different perspectives that I mentioned. One over here on the left is just looking at the carbon dynamics within the forest, and over here on the right is looking at um, looking at it holistically: land use change, harvested wood products for energy, harvested wood products for uh, um, products that we use like furniture and how that interacts with fossil fuels. So next slide. So this is two, the exact same management activity, looking at these two different perspectives. So if you look over here to the left, this is a, a hypothetical forest. It doesn't actually represent something that is uh, that's real, I wanna say that's hypothetical. So this is on a 40 year rotation. Uh, the inspiration for this was Doug Fur out in uh, the Pacific Northwest, which are often on 40 year rotation. So you see here this boom and bust cycle of growth. Then you see the arrow there where there's a timber harvest, then the, the forest regrows and there's a timber harvest and so on and so forth. If you track the dotted line, there is no, with if there's a non-disturbance, right? There is no timber harvest and that's allowed to grow. If you don't consider anything that's coming off the forest system, then harvesting is going to have a, a view of a negative impact on carbon, right? So, um, because the, the carbon potential in the forested ecosystem would never reach that hypothetical undisturbed scenario. But if you look over to the right, the broad view, uh, this is what happens to the carbon um, when it leaves the ecosystem. You can see that it goes through a, a number of pathways. There is long-lived products. Um, and uh, we recently are, we were doing a study for the Forest Service right now uh, where we commissioned a scientist to look at this. And we found that Roughly about half of the carbon that comes off the forested ecosystem is still in long-lived products like furniture after 30 years. So it can represent a pretty significant uh, place for carbon storage, but also they're short-lived products. Not everything goes into furniture. Sometimes things go into pallets or things that are, are um, you know, disposed of much earlier. What you see in black is in the landfill. It's not the best place to store carbon, but um, carbon does get stored there um, in, in our waste, and that gets stored there indefinitely. Um, and lastly, if you look at the, the yellowish, the mustard colored, and, and the brown, that's the energy substitution I mentioned. Generally, there is a one-to-one -one ratio of, of biomass for energy. Um, meaning that if you use um, a ton of carbon, roughly, that of uh, some type of forest um, residue, that that's going to displace the use of one ton of fossil fuels. Uh, with harvested wood products, the IPCC ratio is roughly two to one. So if you, and that would be, for example, if you're using a, um, uh, a steel, uh, a wood beam instead of a concrete or steel beam. 
So roughly across all products usages, that's roughly about a two to one ratio. So long story short, if you look at this perspective, the carbon benefit, uh, there might be actual a carbon benefit pretty early on. And over time with subsequent harvesting, there can actually be more carbon stored not just necessarily on the physical forest, but in a wide variety of products and, um, and, and its ability to displace the use of fossil fuels. You know, thinking about that as, as a type of storage, you can actually have a, a benefit on climate. So how you view the forest system is absolutely critical in your understanding on how harvested wood products play a role in this. Next slide. So I just want to point out that we have a number of communications um, on our external website that you can uh, view. We have forest FAQs for the public. We have, um, uh, we have occasionally written blogs about this topic. Um, you can, here's one in the center. We also have some pamphlets that are available. And next slide. And with that, that's our uh, contact information. I'm ready for questions. Thank you, Dr. McKinley. Um, we will have questions towards the end of the uh, meeting, um, in the second half of the meeting. Um, before we get to the questions, just wanted to um, transition a bit to providing an overview of the development of mass timber in Massachusetts. Um, all right, and how EEA has been involved with supporting the adoption of mass timber into the building sector here. Um, for the purpose of this talk, we'll, we will be focusing on cross laminated timber panels and glue lamb beams, as these are the two most prevalent product categories in the Northeast. Mass timber came to reality here in Massachusetts with the completion of the John D. Oliver Design Building at UMass Amherst in 2017, um, this building here. Since 2017, the introduction of mass timber has become a great example of cooperation across federal, state, and local government, academia, governmental NGOs, and the private sector to meet demand for buildings while reducing emissions. The images on this slide are of buildings built right here in our Commonwealth over the last five years. From um, top left here, this is the um, um, airport terminal at the Beverly Airport. Um, and um, this here I already said is the um, over design building at UMass Amherst. And this building here is the 69A Street um, uh, building in Boston, which had a two story addition on top of a renovated existing um, office and retail building. And this one here, I'm oh, sorry, this one, I'm oh, sorry, this one here is the um, 11E Lennox seven story building, um, uh, 34 unit multifamily project in Roxbury that's currently under construction. And this one here, uh, sorry, uh, this one here is the uh, Department of Employment Assistance building in Brockton. Mass Timber is used across a broad range of building scales for institutional, commercial, and residential buildings with designers, engineers, and developers working to integrate wood materials to minimize the negative uh, climate impact of a building to the greatest extent possible. Much of this work is being driven by life cycle assessments to optimize the use of wood in construction. On the far right, this image right here, um, is life cycle assessment work being uh, done by a team of three Massachusetts firms studying the climate benefits of different configurations of concrete, wood, and steel, EA, and the US uh, Department, Forest Service, um, Department of Agricultural Forest Service both have contributed funding to the development of the um, life cycle assessment to ensure that construction industry can make informed climate decisions regarding building material selection. EEA has funded approximately $500,000 in mass timber research and development projects over the last five years, which has 
enables grant recipients to raise an additional 2.5 million in additional funding to help facilitate the early adoption of mass timber. The, more, the majority of mass timber funding by EEA has gone to the development of cross laminated timber or CLT. Um, using local tree species in an effort to stimulate a green economy based on sustainably managed forests in southern New England. Locally grown CLT is an important strategy towards matching the resiliency and restoration work necessary for our forests with societal needs for climate friendly building products. Preliminary research was started in 2017 at the University of Massachusetts in the lab um, at the Over Design Building. The research team led by Dr. Peggy Clauston consulted early on with staff at the Department of Conservation and Recreation to identify Eastern white pine and Eastern hemlock as suitable candidates to study based on availability of material from working forces. And in the case of Eastern hemlock, the potential to improve the economic value of a species that had historically been overlooked um, by structural soft wood. By soft wood mills. This work proved that both species are capable of being used to produce CLT panels with Eastern hemlock, providing better structural performance overall. Shortly thereafter, the New England Forestry Foundation partnered with the USDA Forest Service to study the feasibility of developing a manufacturing facility for Eastern hemlock across laminated timber based on a sustainable supply of wood sourced from managed forests in Southern Vermont, Southern New Hampshire, and Western and Central Massachusetts. This here is the cover of that report. Um, a, favor a favorable report on sustainable sourcing coupled with technical ability to use Eastern hemlock brings the conversation up to current work on full scale testing and introduction to the market. Right now, 50,000 board feet of Eastern hemlock lumber from Massachusetts, Vermont and New Hampshire is being tested at full scale at the Smart Limb production facility in Alabama. Um, right here, this one, this is a photo of that facility. Upon passage of the structure testing, the local CLT will head to a building currently under design in Metro Boston area. Thinking about policy recommendations in the Clean Energy and Climate Plan to accelerate the adoption of mass timber within our Commonwealth, we are really interested in hearing from you about what should be done um, above um, to continue um, research and then um, development of local CLT to quickly scale up the integration of mass timber in the construction uh, sector. We welcome any ideas that you have on this topic. The scale of forest restoration and resiliency work requires um, climate adaptation, adaptation and mitigation required for excuse me, the scale of forest restoration and resiliency work required for climate adaptation and mitigation requires a diversified all-in approach, which is why we are looking to build upon an existing manufacturing of local wood to extend ecological and social economic climate benefits to every community in Massachusetts. Small businesses are the engine room of rural economies and they provide a direct link from the forest to society. As we begin to use more durable good products to store carbon and avoid emissions, the retention and expansion of local wood business is an important policy subset under the Clean Energy and Climate Plan. An ability of local wood businesses to increase production of quality, long lasting wood like this staircase here, um, or the one in this kitchen, is largely a function of matching supply and demand. Um, a study from 2002, uh, Berlick et al. shows that our uh, wood consumption is um, vastly um, of more so more than that wood production and harvesting in our state. Um, we in our state only harvest about two to three percent of the wood that we actually consume in our state. Food rest, uh, forest restoration and resiliency goals are going to drive the supply volumes for durable wood products as we continue to refine land protection and forest restoration metrics over the next few months. 
harvested wood supplies can be modeled and will likely fall within a range of harvest volumes outlined already in Harvard Forest's um, changes to the land uh, report here um, and the Burlick et al. report that I mentioned here as well. Demand from wood products, uh, local wood, is the other critical side of storing carbon in long-lived um, wood products. We are very interested in hearing from you on ideas that can increase affordable access to quality local wood products. We are also very interested um, to hear on how the Commonwealth can help manufacturers access the technologies they need to improve lumber yield and reduce energy consumption. Policy recommendations targeting this, targeting this issue should help to lower the cost of production for local manufacturers so that they can better compete with alternatives coming from forests around the world. It is about trying to shift, um, it's about trying to shift the green band in the, uh, in the graph of prices on the left here. to the point where buyers can access materials. And so we are now going to transition a little bit um, to support the uh, production of local wood um, to supply um, um, carbon um, storage, locally carbon um, stored carbon. We want to have a better understanding of the, uh, um, of the um, a flow of timber carbons in, in our uh, commonwealth here. So all commercial, uh, all commercial harvesting activities that would move more than 25,000 board feet um, or 50 cords um, are required to follow a forest cutting plan for review and approval by uh, the Department of Conservation and Recreation. And that's required by the Forest Cutting uh, Practices Act. Um, this forest cutting plan uh, requirement uh, represents proposed work that may take up up that may take up to four years um, to do, or may not occur at all. And the reported um, volumes are not independently verified. And there are also except exemptions to the requirement um, um, to file a forest cutting plan. And exemptions include like smaller harvest, other tree cutting activities like agricultural clearing, utility. Uh, corridor maintenance and as well as forest conversion for development. Um, we are thinking about um, improving the uh, adding a new requirement uh, to the forest cutting plan so that way we can track um, where the timber, clear timber, uh, harvested timber will be processed to get a better sense of the carbon flow and where uh, the end uses would be of this timber. Um, the forest cutting plan document um, provides for us um, document, documentation of patterns and trends in harvest volume and products, um, as well as the motivation and intent of the landowners and the involvement of the forester. And so we're thinking that um, having this additional requirement will also help us track the timber flow and um, help us um, verify the amount of timber being harvested in Massachusetts are going into durable good products. We wanted, so this is the end of our presentation and we really wanna hear back from you, um, as we mentioned before, on ways that the Commonwealth can support and scale up the local and sustainable production of durable wood products, especially for building construction. Um, we welcome suggestions for and from landowners, sawmills, foresters, and other entities in the wood products um, on this topic. Um, and um, as I said before, we are also interested in um, hearing from you how on how the Commonwealth can help manufacturers access technologies they need to improve the lumber yield um, and reduce energy consumption, as well as increase the efficiency of the wood that are produced so that there's less um, waste and there's more that are used in durable good products, wood products. And lastly, we are um, um, interested in how we could better track the end use of harvested and cleared trees, especially from activities uh, exempt from the Forest Cutting Practices Act. Um, so very much interested in hearing from you all. Uh, for those who are um, on the um, uh, joining us on the computer, 
you could uh, click on the um, reaction um, button and then you can raise and click on raise your hand to uh, queue up for um, questions um, or for providing oral comments. For those who are joining us on the phone, you can press star nine to indicate you would like to speak. And when we call on you, you will need to press star six to unmute yourself. Again, please limit your questions um, and uh, comments to 20, uh, two minutes or less um, to allow others to provide inputs and comments and ask questions as well. Um, so with that, I know there are a lot of comments. Um, there are some questions in the chat as well. Um, to get us started, I'm going to go to the um, first person here in this queue for public comments um, or questions. And then um, in the meantime, I'll be reviewing the questions in the chat to, to see if we can bring um, any of those uh, to, to uh, for discussion. All right. So next up here is this person by the name of Tribal Scribal. Can you hear uh, the name? I forgot to change the name. The name is Don Ogden, and I do have a question. I'm wondering if uh, EEA has ever done a study on the timber flow of our trees to Canada. It seems to be, and I never get out on I-91 without see, seeing one or more uh, logging trucks headed north with Quebec plates. You have any uh, data on that? Uh, good question. Um, I'm going to see um, if any of my colleagues can jump in here. Um, I'm looking down the list to see if um, folks from the DCR um, to run of conservation and recreation will be able to jump in um, as they are most intimately aware of all the different data sources out there. Um, But we can certainly get back to you um, on this answer for this answer. Please, please do. Okay, thank you. Um, is there anything else, or would you like to yield to the next person? I'll yield to the next person. Great, thank you so much. Um, before we go to the next person, I see in the chat here someone asked um, how to raise your hand. So um, if you look at the bottom left corner of my screen here, there should be, uh, you know, what the reaction icon looks like. It should be in the menu at the bottom. If you don't see the menu, uh, try to hover your mouse at the bottom of your screen and it should pop up. And then you should be able to see the reaction icon, click on it, and then a window should pop up to, um, to show the different reactions, one of which is to raise your hand. So if you're still having problems, please uh, let me know and I can, um, or you can call in as well and I can um, unmute you when, after you press start nine. All right, so we're gonna go next to the uh, next person in line here, Glenn Ayers. Hi, thank you very much for taking questions uh, today. And I'm glad, really, really happy to hear that you're going to be closing the MEPA loophole, which uh, currently allows timber harvesting logging on public lands in Massachusetts without any uh, environmental review under the Massachusetts Environmental Policy Act, as long as an approved forest cutting plan has been conducted. And of course, that means that it uh, is subject to a 10-day presumptive approval with no administrative review possible to the public. Uh, even for commercial logging of mature forests on public lands in Massachusetts, there is no possibility of the public having any say in that. And DCR has never conducted an honest climate impact analysis of their commercial logging program. They planned over the past 10 years to cut down more than a million mature trees on our state forests. They didn't, they didn't accomplish that because uh, they didn't get bids on a lot of those jobs, but they planned to cut down more than a million mature trees. And the forest cutting plans themselves are based on very outdated best management practices. They're obsolete. 
They haven't been revised for more than a decade. And the best management practices do not include any sort of climate practices or anything related to carbon storage on our forests. And so I'm glad to hear that you're plugging that MEPA loophole, which is large enough to drive a logging truck through, and that you now will be requiring a full MEPA review for commercial logging on public lands. That's a great policy decision on the part of the executive office. And I'd like to thank you very much for that. Thank you, Glenn, for your comment. I just wanted to note that um, we are still hearing from the public and stakeholders on this policy recommendation from the um, uh, Implementation Advisory Committee. And so uh, nothing has been set in stone yet, but we definitely are um, hearing you and your comment, and then we want to hear uh, from others as well. But I, um, if if I if I can just um, also add that this particular policy is actually geared towards um, the if I understand it correctly, it's actually geared towards um, uh, having a tree removal threshold for projects um, that are converting forest into development. Um, but again, I, I may have misinterpreted, so I think this is something for me to get back to the Implementation Advisory Committee on for further clarification. But thank you so much, Glenn, for your comment. We're gonna go next to Gia Go ahead, Gia, can you hear me? I can. Yes, hi, thank you. Sorry about that. Um, yes, I am very concerned about the selective information that's been presented here today. We were invited to a meeting uh, concerning how to incorporate more forest protection as well as supporting local or implied forestry and forest product industries into the CECP. And I have heard a very biased presentation on, especially from the US Forest Service, which is um, reason for being this, this agency was created to support timber products. And to hear this presenter quote the IPCC of the UN selectively when the real recommendation of the IPCC for global warming mitigation is to leave forests intact as wild, not as a timber resource, uh, otherwise known as proforestation. Um, it is really time for the EEA to be responsible to the constituents uh, by considering that keeping forests as forests is only one alternative. And we are not seeing true, honest comparisons of alternatives. A lot of our taxpayer dollars went into the year long study on the roadmap to 2050, but the uh, alternative of not cutting specifically in our, on our public lands was never brought into the land use uh, scenarios as an option whatsoever. I'd also like to say that in regard to the solar presentation that we just heard, we didn't hear any suggestion that alternatives of installing solar on rooftops and brownfields would be compared to the apparently preconceived plan to install or support or incentivize more ground mounted solar. So I am asking the EEA to be honest and to not waste the public's time with propaganda sessions, but to give a well rounded and science based presentation on any topic that you're asking us to tune into and participate in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gia, for that comment. I'm sorry you feel that way. Um, Dr. D um, Duncan McKinley came highly recommended, and uh, there has been a lot of um, scientists, uh, both in and out of forestry, who uh, agree with the fact that forest management is important. And with that, with forest management um, also comes 
um, sustainable. Oh, I just like to, I just like, yeah. I, I just like to add for for the um, for for the other listeners, my my people on this call, that um, it is true that the EEA, EEA has hired some wonderfully true scientists with great expertise in land and forest carbon in the state of Massachusetts, specifically um, the the Harvard Forest folks. Um, and uh, the problem is that UEEA have, have bound their arms so that they've only been allowed to study certain scenarios and they have been, uh, they haven't been allowed, they haven't been paid to look at the alternative of a no cut approach. And that needs to change. We've been saying this for years. Thank you. Thanks, Tia. Um... Eric, do you want to um, jump in and uh, address Gia's comment on solar study? Yeah, no, happy to. Um, the technical potential of solar study, uh, the methodology that's behind that uh, hasn't been developed. We have some ideas of the direction of where it's going to go, but it's certainly going to uh, be directed based off of public input. Um, that said, uh, this. I anticipate that that study will not be limited to just mounted solar. Um, we are looking at the total technical potential, uh, including uh, the value that solar uh, sited on buildings and in brownfield and landfill locations have to uh, Massachusetts. So uh, I would anticipate, highly anticipate that that would be a component um, in the program as well. Great. Thank you. Um, all right, so we're going to go next. Um, who is the caller for the phone number, um, error code 413? I'm asking you to unmute. Can you unmute? I think you have to do star six. Yes, uh, good afternoon. Uh, Evan Delolio on the call representing Roberts Brothers Lumber. Um, just wanted to say that I really uh, want to thank EEA for the time that you're putting into this. Uh, obviously, it's a very detailed review process that brings into um, light many uh, questions, many questions concerning the climate, many questions concerning our local economy, many questions concerning the environment, and of course, also many questions concerning all of us um, truly as consumers. Um, I think that in a, in a growing uh, world um, with increased consumerism, the attention that's being paid towards the sourcing of uh, forest products, many of them durable, long-lasting uh, goods, is becoming ever more important. Um, you know, I, I think that you see this daily, for example, and clearly just the number of businesses uh, that have chosen across the country and across the world, for example, to only source products from organizations, or excuse me, from companies that are certified by organizations like the Sustainable uh, um, uh, forestry uh, organizations like FSC or SFI, for example. And I think that something that's important is that um, I, I just want to really set the record straight on something. The IPCC, um, especially for some of the previous commenters, um, has never endorsed not harvesting forest products. They have never endorsed not managing forests to include timber harvesting. That is just simply not the case. The IPCC actually uh, is encouraging more responsible forest management as one tool in the fight against climate change. So I just really would like to state that because uh, it's not an accurate position. And none of the European countries that were involved uh, in any of the negotiations or discussions uh, ended up walking away from the table in that regard. So the, the second thing, though, is that in the Commonwealth, and, and, I, and I applaud the interest that EEA has in doing more to encourage um, the manufacture of products that will store carbon long term, namely more advanced lumber products uh, like cross laminated timber. But one of the challenges is that we have been in a spiral decline, particularly in central and western Massachusetts, where the few remaining sawmill businesses are left in the state, uh, in terms of those businesses being able to compete in the global market. Um, there's been a great deal of scaling of sawmills, particularly in northern New England and in Canada, and those are the types of businesses, never mind other mills abroad, that domestic mills are competing against. So I think that creating um, a market in Massachusetts for Massachusetts mills and Massachusetts timber harvesters, foresters, and the other uh, pieces in that, in that pipeline uh, would be a, an outstanding item. 
So one of the questions I have is that um, in, in process of not only incentivizing the use of this material locally, but um, also uh, being able to incentivize its manufacture here in Massachusetts, um, has EEA considered any policies, whether just through EEA or in working with other secretariats, to encourage uh, the sustainable growth and continued existence of a local value-added um, forest products community, and simply not only just harvesting timber here, um, but, but exporting it to other states uh, or to Canada to produce this material. Uh, thank you so much. Let me see if I can um, summarize your question. Have EA been um, looking into ways to support the uh, manufacturing of local wood here for Massachusetts, but also for uh, shipping to nearby states? Did I summarize that question? Yes, Portland? yes. I mean, and, and yeah, you did. And, and not that there won't ever be cross uh, state or cross international trade. I mean, obviously, that's a benefit to the economy. But but will there uh, be any efforts or have you considered any efforts to also make sure that we still uh, can continue to make these products here, particularly because in order to make CLT, uh, it really all starts with local sawmills? Yeah. So, um, so one thing I failed to mention in the presentation, uh, and I'd like to mention it now, um, is Sean Mahoney is the director of um, uh, wood utilization. Um, let's see. A wood utilization and markets program um, at the Department of Conservation and Recreation. He provided a lot of information in the slides that I presented after Dr. McKinley's presentation. And he would definitely know a lot of the efforts that are um, being um, pursued at uh, EEA umbrella and specifically uh, within DCR uh, to support uh, the local wood market. Um, I. Unfortunately, he is not able to join um, us today due to family um, commitments, but um, perhaps I could give um, put uh, Kurt on the hot seat. Perhaps you can um, address or answer the caller's question. Uh, yes, Han, uh, we have been working with uh, a variety of parties to look at the potential for wood product utilization, uh, cross laminated timber and the like. And uh, with the goal of having more of the wood in cr uh, cross laminated timber and other mass timber products come from Massachusetts and just generally seeing more of the harvested wood in long-term uh, storage as opposed to emitted more uh, quickly. And uh, that's something that we are continuing to uh, explore means of supporting. Thank you. Um, all right. Before we go to the next person in the queue, um, there is a question in the chat here um, asking whether or not the MassGIS solar siting study that uh, Eric referenced um, is available. Yes, it is available. Um, I believe Eric's presentation has a link to um, that tool. And so when this presentation is uh, posted, you'll be able to um, click on that link. But Eric, perhaps uh, in the meantime, would you be able to copy and paste the link to that study in the chat? I think that would be helpful for um, uh, folks. Thank you. Sure. So we're going sure. go... to okay, go. We're going to go next to Martha Hanner. Yes. All right. Thank you. I w wanted to ask specifically uh, to our uh, colleague here from the Forest Service. It's well documented that forests draw down about 30 percent of human caused carbon dioxide emission annually. You can see that directly in the Mauna Loa uh, CO2 measurements. Uh, the Forest Service had a study a decade ago. Uh, that came to that conclusion. And so my question is then, how can you balance that with uh, statements about solar siting or, oh, it's okay because forests regrow? Because we also know that uh, it takes at least 50 years for a forest to regrow. And it's the 1% of the most mature trees that uh, have the largest carbon storage. Furthermore, that when the soil is disturbed, it loses 
much of its carbon storage as well that takes many decades to grow back. So I particularly object then to statements that uh, the use of biofuel, that is burning uh, wood pellets and so on to generate electricity is defined as renewable energy. And I'm concerned that DOER still uh, defines that as renewable energy worthy of, of rebates because burning wood emits more CO2 per kilowatt hour generated than burning coal. Anyone who's sat around a campfire knows that burning wood generates more particulate pollution than uh, burning coal. And because it takes many decades to regrow at a time where we have a carbon emergency, uh, we cannot say that that is renewable. So I would like to ask why it is that you still include um, burning woody biomass as, as something good about a forest product. Um, so, uh, Ari, I'm going to go to you, uh, but perhaps if I could um, answer a little bit, take a stab at this, and then feel free to correct me and elaborate on it. Um, so I think the biomass, um, Dr. McKinley is saying that um, there, you know, there is use for wood for biomass, but certainly we're not saying that um, cut down a whole tree and make it into wood pellets. Um, I think there are different parts of the tree that could be uh, made. Um, for example, perhaps, perhaps like branches, trees that are uh, residues as part of harvesting um, activities. Uh, um, we would harvest the wood and use the trunk, the, the trunk of the tree for durable goods that live in, in, in buildings and um, um, other durable wood, pro wood products. But like the trees and the, uh, sorry, the branches um, could be used um, for, um, you know, uh, wood pellets or anything like that, that are, would have been left in the forest floor anyways. And so DOER has a really stringent um, definition of what is considered renewable wood. So um, Eric, do you wanna jump in here? Yeah, no, Han, yeah, that's that's largely right, yeah. Um, and, and the, I'm sorry, I, I missed the individual's name here, but um, uh, she identified a number of factors that need to get considered into uh, the uh, greenhouse the life cycle of greenhouse gas impacts that are associated to um, the combustion of wood, um, and and I, uh, you know, a few things that I just reiterate is that uh, DOR does have statutory uh, requirement uh, to have biomass within the RPS um, uh, that does need to be low emissions. Uh, we do base our life cycle greenhouse gas assessment um, uh, on the Manimit study that was produced uh, back in in uh, 2010, and uh, 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 the, the concept there was emblazoned within the regulations in 2012 and um, has been maintained. And that, that really is that uh, biomass is not carbon neutral. The combustion of biomass is not carbon neutral. There are factors that need to get taken into, into account, uh, including forestry practices that are associated with the type of the feedstock that is there and what happens to it thereafter. Um, and, and so those, those are the critical elements that go into our thinking in the assessment of those uh, programs for uh, um, incentives. Great, and uh, Dr. McKinley, I just wanted to see if you wanted to um, jump in. Um. Yeah, thank you. Um, one thing I, I want to mention to, uh, as a follow-up to those who think that uh, what I presented is not based on the IPCC. The, I cited a paper early on in which the presentation is based and um, eight of my co-authors were on the IPCC and shared in the Nobel Peace Prize on that. So it is aligned with the IPCC. Second, regarding this question, um, absolutely you're spot on, Han, that, um, that no one is going to be cutting down trees for biomass energy. It's residue, right? So sawdust, bark that may not otherwise be used are being purposed um, for the use of, of, of bioenergy. Um, and I also want to put into perspective that um, you know there's a lot of things going on on the on the forest estate, um, and you know at least with speaking with the Forest Service. Um, there is a place for everything, right? There is a place 
you know, to continue to uh, encourage um, mature forests to uh, that are protected. Um, there are places, um, you know, most of our lands are over 50% are congressionally designated where we don't operate them. Only a very small sliver, about 27% of the, the forested land is even suitable for timber harvest. And only a very tiny portion of that is ever used for harvesting. And I think that perspective might be helpful for the, 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 the state as well, is that I don't think anyone is advocating clearing all the state forests, you know, to go in, into harvested wood products and, um, and, and biomass energy. It's, it's probably a, a very small portion of, of the forest estate. And, you know, from a climate change perspective, um, we're in this for the long term, right? If you look at the nat natural climate change solutions uh, and the role of uh, forestry in the land sector in it, there is, a, there is a role over the next 30, 40, 50 years, even up to a century where there's a role, right? And so we have to think about not only things that are absolutely in the near term, but also the long term, right? And so that's where I think um, biomass energy comes into play. Yes, it might take decades for that tree to grow back. Um, but if you're using fossil fuels, that those emissions are never going back um, into any type of storage. It stays in the atmosphere and those emissions stay in the atmosphere for centuries and half-life is millennia. So that that's kind of the, the alternative there. That's all. Thank you. Um, we're going to go next to Michael C Collette. Yes, hi. Uh, thanks for holding this forum. Um, I have a question, um, but like, as someone else mentioned, uh, the, the presentations to, seem to me to be all related to using more energy, cutting more trees, burning more trees, building more wooden buildings. And I'm wondering, um, the, there's a, there's a an international push to protect 30% of the planet uh, for climate and biodiversity and human health. And uh, that has been endorsed by the United Nations, by the, Obama, the, the Biden administration, by hundreds of scientists, by lots of conservation organizations, um, but only about less than 2% of Massachusetts has permanent protection from logging or development or other kinds of industrial uses. I'm wondering what, how is EEA uh, responding to the 30, and, and it's 30% by thir 2030 that, that we're talking about. So we're, this, we really have a tight time frame. What is EEA doing to respond to the 30 by 30 proposal? Thank you, Michael, for the, sorry, go ahead, Michael. Did you want to add some more? No, no, thank you, that's, that's it. Okay, thank you, Michael, for that question. Um, yeah, so we, <laughs> Um, I don't, I'm not sure you were able to join our second meeting um, that was on January 14th, um, where we talked about the, um, the goal of protecting, permanently protecting 30% of our natural working lands um, by 2030. Uh, right now, we have 27% of our natural working lands are protected permanently um, through a mix of uh, state ownership with uh, municipal uh, ownership, some federal, but then also um, land trust and other um, conservation uh, nonprofits. And so that number is uh, verified um, by Mask Audubon they, in their own losing ground uh, report um, published in 2020, I believe, as well as you can download the open space data layer. Um, and I believe there's another data layer. Um, I'm not sure if it's public, but the chapter 61 program data layers, um, and you can check that. I I know because I just asked um, someone at um, the um, uh, um, our department of uh, our uh, program on um, GIS to to do this calculation. So it's it's twenty seven percent that are permanently protected from development. Certainly, some of the uh, acreages 
are um, managed and they are managed, which also includes some um, harvesting for um, increased um, resiliency as well as um, carbon sequestration and as well as a habitat um, as well. So uh, just wanted to, to respond to your question there. Actually, I'm going to take this opportunity to put someone on the spot. Um, Brian Hawthorne from uh, Division uh, Department of Fish and Game, um, particularly Mass Wildlife. Um, I'm not sure if you're ready, but I'd love to put you on the spotlight um, to see if you can talk a little more about the management of um, Fish and Game's uh, property for uh, wildlife habitat and, um, and the carbon impacts uh, from that. Certainly, I'll be glad to. Um, I wasn't wasn't expecting to, uh, to to have to present on this, so I don't have everything prepared. But um, Mass Wildlife manages all of our land for the biodiversity of the Commonwealth, and we are we are not able to pick and choose which biodiversity we protect. Uh, we are supporting all of the species that occur in the Commonwealth, as well as the natural vegetation communities uh, that they rely on. That means that in some cases, uh, we manage using various mechanical processes, including timber harvesting, uh, in order to maintain or restore uh, natural communities uh, to better support those species of conservation concern. Um, we do use commercial timber harvesting, uh, and the reason for that is that there is value in the trees that we are cutting down that is on state land and in order to protect that value for the people of the commonwealth we can't just give away the trees so we do uh, engage in timber sales the amount of money that uh, we receive back from those timber sales is far less than what we spend on other um, habitat management costs such as uh, invasive plant control application of prescribed fire and, and other things. Uh, we have done a carbon analysis of our, of our properties, and we found that the amount of carbon sequestration uh, that we are foregoing uh, in any given year is just a, a few percent. Um, the, uh, the numbers are available on our, on our website. Uh, and I should point out that those numbers are uh, were developed in a conservative manner. In other words, where we had uncertainty about the amount of carbon that would be released, we always chose estimates that overstated the amount of carbon released. And that when we were looking at uh, numbers for carbon that was being sequestered or maintained in storage, we underestimated that wherever possible. And again, the methodology for that analysis is available on our website. Um, so hopefully that answers some of your question, but I did just want to point out that we all, all of our land is permanently protected as permanent as any protection is possible in the Commonwealth. That means that we that the land is protected under Article 97 of the Constitution uh, and in order to take it out of protection would require uh, both a um, two thirds vote of the legislature, as well as the executive, um, the governor signing off on that to remove something from Article 97. Um, there are some people who say that the, um, the highest and best use of our land should be carbon. And uh, that, however, is not what the statute states for us. We are required to, to protect the full biodiversity of the, of the Commonwealth. And that includes species that require specialized natural communities, such as barrens ecosystems, uh, our native grasslands, and other types. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Um, appreciate it. Um, and if possible, um, Gio Neswell asked for the website that you referenced um, for that um, publication. If, if, and your convenience, if you could put that in the chat, that would be great. Yep, I'll paste it right in. Okay, we're gonna go next to Dick and Crane. Hi, can you hear Hi, me? I can hear, yes, I can hear you well. Hi, I'm Dickon Crane. I'm a forest and farmland owner in Dalton, Mass. And I appreciate the, uh, the questions, um, particularly as to how carbon flows through forests and through human activities. Uh, because the, 
the decisions that a landowner makes um, as to what trees are going to best store carbon aren't just about how much carbon they have today, but do they, um, are they vulnerable to lose that carbon? Um, on our property, we've lost thousands of ash trees. Uh, there's mm -hmm. the risk of losing many more species um, from uh, invasive pests. Um, and also what, as the climate changes, what species of trees are most apt to thrive and therefore store more carbon um, than the species that currently are very vulnerable to dying and releasing their carbon. So I think it's a much more complicated question that can simply be answered by saying, if you don't do anything, you're doing the right thing. I honestly, honestly. think that's a, a, uh, a bad uh, message to try to uh, project because it is a much more complicated uh, situation and our impacts are everywhere. Uh, I don't think you can say that, well, if we just leave that forest alone, it will do fine because we've already impacted it through the invasives that we've brought and the changes to the climate that we've created. But there is no, that isn't even a sensible thing to say. Um, but I think that the, the most important thing is that we really learn what, what is going to help us in this battle against climate change the most and not just base decisions on uh, flimsy information. And so I think getting, getting good information, learning, putting time, money, um, an effort in understanding how forest systems work and the climate works and uh, that is gonna be the best that we can do to protect ourselves in the future. Thanks. Thank you so much Dickens. Um, yes, if, if, if uh, you or anyone else um, would love to provide any suggestions for us to do better tracking, um, we, we are all ears. Um, thank you so much. We're gonna go next to Janet Sinclair. Um, yes, hi, am I on? I yes, I tell. can hear you, Janet. Okay, okay, great, thank you. I just wanna make one comment um, that Michael Kelly's question about um, land being permanently protected, he referring to land that's not um, under a management program, that's not being logged, that's different than you know state land that's permanent, permanently protected. That's what he's referring to. And so that just, he, he didn't follow up, but I just wanted to make sure that you knew that that's what he was saying. <clears throat> My question is for Brian Hawthorne. Um, I'm wondering, Brian, if you could talk about the reserves that you have already in your wildlife management areas, like how did you decide on them? What do you think the value is for them? What are your plans for the future for your reserve areas? So um, we have a number of reserves that were specified. It's uh, during uh, 2006 was when the EEA forest reserves process um, happened. Those reserves were then uh, ratified by our Fisheries and Wildlife Board. And those areas are off limits to commercial harvesting. Uh, in fact, to all management, with the exception of um, wildfire control, if, it, if it's threatening the uh, abutting um, properties, or invasive species control, again, where, it, where it's um, threatening abutting properties. Uh, those reserves remain as reserves. Uh, at the time that we initially um, created them, it was about, I believe, I'm, it was between 10 and 15% of our total land holdings. Uh, since 2006, we have protected additional land, and we are in the process now of identifying additional reserve acres uh, that we would then propose to our Fisheries and Wildlife Board to add on to our reserve system. Our goal for those reserves is essentially to provide large roadless areas of forest that are, that are allowed to mature into a biolog biologically mature uh, state. Um, and uh, to provide a, 
No, uh, I see Don Ogden is saying reserve for only 10 years, like with DCR. These reserves are in perpetuity for mass wildlife. We have no intention of ever removing something from a reserve. Um, and it would require the it would require action by our Fisheries and Wildlife Board to take it out of that status. Do you mind just saying a little bit more, like because there's these comments here about why it's why you know saying reserves or non-logged areas, like just saying that if it's a blanket statement is kind of like not necessarily the best thing. So obviously there's a reason reason why you um, have these reserves. You think that there's a value to them. Part A, part B. Um, you, I mean, my understanding is that unless these reserves are made permanent in some kind of legislative or some kind of way, unless there's something there that says these reserves are permanent, that they're really not, they're up to your agency. So I'm just wondering, do, A, do you, do, you do you allow the public in on these conversations about your reserves? And B, would you, are you opposed to using you know your existing law that's for nature preserves are you opposed to putting your reserves into into that status that's over in the nature preserves law you have one nature preserve you have one it's a bog in in near worcester but what about making all the rest of these if you really this is really your goal and this is your intention i think it would be nice for you to actually assure the public that you know and really put them into permanent reserves which they are not now so I, you, there were a number of questions there. Han, what would, would you like me to address any of those? Uh, sure, why don't you address it and then, um, and then I will jump in. Sure. All right, so um, in terms of the value that these reserves have to us, in, in um, 2006, when, when EEA went through the process of identifying uh, forest reserves statewide, we looked at the available science at the time in terms of return intervals for natural disturbance um, in, and based on the best history that we had from, uh, from uh, coring in bogs and that sort of thing. And we identified that around 10 to 15% of biologically mature forest uh, was necessary in order to support all biodiversity in the Commonwealth. And that's where our number came from and why we're, why we're currently considering adding additional reserves. Uh, in terms of uh, the protection status of them, the Fisheries and Wildlife Board is a citizen board that is appointed by the by the governor and governor's council, um, and and essentially is the policy setting board for our agency. So I do not have any policy making uh, role in in Mass Wildlife or in EEA. Uh, so I would defer to them for any uh, decisions or comments about about legislation or status. Okay, thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much for answering that. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for letting me ask it. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you, Brian, and thank you, Janet, for, for your questions. Um, just wanted to uh, jump in in the sense that we, we did have um, Peter Church and Jessica Rowcroft um, in the second meeting talking about their um, forest designation and landscape, forest landscape designation um, process that is kicking off. Um, and so they will have a uh, stakeholder process as part of that as well. So I encourage you, Janet, to um, bring your co concerns and comments to that process as well. And I just wanted to um, say that, not just only to you, Janet, but to everyone that we are listening and um, we definitely wanna uh, say that we appreciate other comments that have been shared thus far and we are really taking it to heart. Um, and so we just hope that this is a dialogue, not just a one-way uh, communication from us to you or from you to us, but a dialogue between um, us all. Great, okay. Thank you. All right. Um, so I don't see any other hands, and we have about fifteen minutes left of this meeting. Um, I wanted to maybe pause and see if any of my colleagues wanted to. Um, jump in and elaborate on any of the um, questions or responses uh, to date while I look through the chat to see if there have been any unanswered questions. All right. Um, all right, I 
there's a lot that's in the chat. <laughs> so it's, I'm not picking out questions very easily. So forgive me for those who are um, waiting for their questions to be answered. Please feel free to raise your hand uh, and ask your questions that way, or you can paste your questions again uh, so I can see it. Um, yeah. Oh, okay. I see the question. Will we please have Dr. Bill Mall present? Um, uh, this actually is a last meeting that we have been planned, but I, I will take that suggestion to heart and I will look him up and, and see what we can do. So we're going to go next to Michelle Mannion uh, here. Uh, Gia will get to you next, um, seeing how Michelle hasn't ha got a chance to time it. Hi, Han. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Oh, great. Thanks for the presentations um, and the opportunity um, to weigh in. And we'll be submitting um, detailed, detailed comments and uh, a lot more in the coming days. But just curious about more of a process and timing question um, in terms of the, um, for the July Clean Energy and Climate Plan submission, is that really just going to be covering recommendations and policy, uh, potential policy approaches for the 2025 and 20. 30 natural working land sector, and then later in the year, we'll address 2050. Could you clarify on that? Sure. Um, yeah, sure. The um, climate law um, passed last year says that uh, we have to finalize and submit to the legislator, um, legislature um, the Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2025 and 2030 by July 1. Um, and the Clean Energy and Climate Plan for 2050 is due by January 1 of 2023. So essentially the end of this year. Um, yep. Yeah. And so the Clean Energy and Climate Plan will have proposed emissions limits and sublimits for um, buildings, resident, within buildings is residential and commercial, um, and then um, transportation, um, power sector, non-energy, and um, it will also have goals, greenhouse gas reduction and carbon sequestration goals for natural working lands. And we'll have uh, proposed policy, um, policies for uh, meeting both the emissions limits and sublimits and the um, global uh, in the natural working lands goals for those two years. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Michelle. Uh, we're going to go. Gia, if you don't mind, I'm going to go to Susan since she hasn't got a chance to uh, ask her question or, or um, provide comments. Susan, can you uh, unmute yourself? Oh, thank you so much. Appreciate it. Uh, this, this question is for Eric Seltzer. Um, uh, uh, your presentation was uh, titled Avoiding Forest Conversion. Uh, but I didn't hear a direct answer about uh, whether forests are going to be um, protected uh, in the plan against uh, solar array development. Um, are you are you going to look for all the other alternatives besides forests, or forests still going to be considered? I, I didn't quite understand that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I think you're referring to the technical potential of solar study and the methodology that would be assessing uh, really where to be um, putting solar within the state. Um, I, I, I do anticipate that there will be some baseline assumptions of certain areas within the state that will be prohibited uh, or, or will be modeled to be having solar prohibited. Um, um, I think based off the stakeholder input will will help to inform us about what those areas are. Um, um, but uh, I, I do anticipate that we'll look at some level of ground mounted solar, uh, recognizing that that is a component to the decarbonization roadmap that's out there as well um, on what we'll need in order to meet our net zero by 2050 goals. And who are the stakeholders who will be making that decision? Supposedly, we haven't developed a stakeholder plan yet, and uh, in, in, we're at the early stages of this, where we're about to issue out the RFQ, the request for qualification to hire a consultant. Uh, I anticipate through that proposal submission to us, we'll be 
um, seeking input uh, from them on how best to engage stakeholders and who we should be identifying. Uh, so it hasn't yet been defined, but the intention here is that it will be broad and wide uh, and have a specific uh, um, focus as well on environmental justice communities. Are the Massachusetts taxpayers considered stakeholders? Yeah, certainly. Our intent for stakeholder engagement will uh, have a large focus in Massachusetts. No, no, I mean the taxpayers. Yes. Okay. So forests are still on the table to be used for solar arrays, to be cut for solar arrays, I take it? If you're asking about the technical potential of study of what we're looking at assessing uh, to help inform us of our policies going forward, we're still developing that methodology and that methodology will be developed based off of public stakeholder uh, involvement. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank All you. Right, thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, sorry for the wait, Gia. We're gonna go to Gia next. Yeah, I have two questions, but I'm not sure if someone's still on the call from DCR. Um, who in particular, uh, Tia? I don't see anyone listed from DCR. I'll just um, pose my questions and if they're not present, then it can be for the record and I'll make a public records request if need be. Um, may I just? Sure. Okay, so my first question is for the, the forest service. Uh, speaker from the Forest Service. Um, can you estimate on average how much of the carbon present in a harvested tree winds up in a durable forest product, such as furniture or uh, building material? If you could give us a range, if not an average number there. My question for the DCR is, um, and this would probably require a follow-up, is um, for all the proposed forest cutting on public lands that are active proposals at this stage, how much carbon would be lost in the process of keeping forests as forests, but selectively harvesting uh, carbon material from the forests, including impacts to the soil and below ground uh, parts of the trees? Thank you, Gia, for those questions. Um, I'm not sure if Mr. Mc, uh, Dr. McKinley is still with us, but if you are, feel free to jump in. Um, but it sounds like, Gia, your questions get to a lot of the, um, the analysis that um, our Harvard Forest and UMass Amherst researchers are looking into and have looked into. Uh, I believe, I think one of your first question, um, Please correct me if I got your first question wrong. Your first question is asking how much of carbon is assumed to remain, uh, or to, to, to keep from tree to cross limited timber or other durable good products, correct? Um, is, was that your first question, Gia? Yes, meaning how much of the woody material, the carbon-based material in an average harvested tree winds up in the product that we're, that is being called durable, although it's not as durable as a living tree. Most on average, the tree has a greater lifespan ahead. Oh. Um, okay. I'm trying yeah. to find that um, the number, uh, but I suggest you, Gia, uh, to look into the land sector technical report of the 2050 roadmap. Um, the researchers use Smith et al. Um, well, is there Sorry. anyone, is the, is, the, is, is the speaker from the U.S. Forest Service or Duncan oh, McKinley yeah, okay. interested in Yeah, Dr. That? McKinley, I see and you now. A quick, quick review. And I should say that, um, you know, it's highly variable depending on species, the size. Um, for example, um, in uh, Brazil, where they're planting eucalyptus, none of those trees go into uh, durable long-lived products to go on the pulp and paper, right? Um, but <clears throat> those trees- Let's see don't... if we can keep it relevant to Massachusetts, please. Yeah, I, okay. Um, 
I'm just saying that there's a variation, right? Um, so the with respect to the Forest Service, that's all I can really speak about uh, coming off a of national forest system lands. It's a lot of uh, high value uh, wood. So therefore, the, when there's high value, generally goes into um, a greater percentage of it goes into long-lived products. I believe the number is around 50 to 60% um, initially and um, on our forest. I don't know what it is for Massachusetts. So you're saying about 40 to 50% of the material is otherwise, is, is wines is not, not getting into the durable product. I just want to make sure I understand. Yeah, that's right. It goes into short-lived products. They, they're a sawdust waste with the production of, of, of wood, um, you know, like two by fours and stuff like that. But I should say there's no real waste because all the it goes into, um, you know, a particle board. Um, uh, sometimes it goes into heating or, uh, or providing energy for the mill. Um, so it, there's really no waste, but that's the portion that goes into hard monolith products. So, but that's okay. But you, you are acknowledging that there's a distinction between durable and those others, those other uses. So, yeah, um, yeah. Uh, if I can jump in a little bit, um, do you definitely please see the land sector technical report in there? Um, I believe there is a diagram in there uh, that talks about the carbon allocation assumptions uh, that the researchers from Harvard Forest and UMass Amherst used. They certainly got this from Smith et al. 2006, I think, uh, study. And they are um, being uh, commissioned to update this analysis with latest uh, information on um, carbon flow uh, and processing. Um, because that paper Smith et al. 2006 is, is 20 years old. Um, and so that's work is ongoing and we'd love to share that um, result uh, once we um, are able to, to wrap up the study. So more to come on that, Dia. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, since this meeting had a lot to do with how durable wood products are good carbon storage solutions, we, I'd love to hear from the EEA what they think about the 50% that's not um, being utilized in that manner um, in the future. I don't wanna put you on the spot with four minutes to go. So um, others feel free to jump in, but I'll uh, take a stab at re um, answering your question, Gia, is that I believe I'm looking at the diagram here. I couldn't pull up the report quickly enough, but I'm looking at the diagram that I pulled, I think from the report that the researchers provide. It's actually growing, if I can, I have it on a different computer, that's why. <laughs> I can't share my screen on this different computer. Growing stock cohorts more than greater than 20 years is 86% uh, going to the growing stock. And then um, there's a further breakdown of it from, in terms of like how many, what the percentage will go into saw timber, how the percentage goes into pole timber. Um, and then from there it goes into saw log versus pulp wood versus bark versus fuel wood. And then it then goes further into um, wood that's used in furniture and other durable good products versus <coughs> landfill versus um, emitted, uh, in, uh, emitted with energy capture and then emitted just in general. So I, I really encourage you to, to look at that um, diagram since it believes you Smith et al. Um, study, which perhaps could be more local. That said, um, um, okay, go ahead. Did you if, want to If I in? might, I think directionally, we want to see more of the harvested wood in durable products uh, and are working on policies as part of this uh, effort that might do that. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Kurt. Um, all right, we have two minutes left, but I see that Michelle and Susan, I think you already asked your questions. And if these are new questions, please uh, feel free to jump uh, in. Otherwise, 
I will uh, turn it over to Under Secretary Chang for closing remarks. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the robust uh, question here. I, um, you know, as you all notice, this is a system issue that we do need to take good care of our forest and land. At the same time, we need to have a, a broader way of thinking about what's best for the climate, right? So this is a balance that we certainly at EEA take seriously and want to make sure we strike the balance. Um, so all the agencies represented here and have chimed in, thank you very much. And thank you also to um, Dr. McKinley for joining us. We really, really appreciate your expertise and experience to be devoted to this. I do ask that stakeholders, um, or all of participants be, uh, be respectful of what we're trying to do here. And uh, I do hope that you understand that we are trying to strike that balance. We are not here to, um, to find one biased way to do things and support that uh, forever. Uh, we are listening to you, um, but I also expect and would prefer that everyone stays respectful in these conversations. Um, okay, even if it's too late to find a balance, we still have to do our best going forward. And this entire office and all of the agencies supporting it is, is trying to find the best path for the Commonwealth. And this, and we do carry with us a systems thinking in terms of trying to find the balance of the resources that we have and the resources that we need. So, and this is true, not just for the land sector, but um, for really all the entire economy. I mean, we do need clean resources and sometimes we have to build them. And we do need to uh, protect our forest and land, but sometimes we need to protect them in a way that we might otherwise, you know, leave untouched. Um, so I think we are um, we are doing our best, and we invite people to speak here to pr provide what we think is material that's worth sharing. And you know, I think everybody's time is very valuable. We are not doing this to waste anybody's time. So I just want to make sure that people are um, understanding as we are understanding of different perspectives exist on this topic. So with that, um, I just want to thank all the speakers and all the people who have responded to questions. Um, we will continue to work our best, do our best to, to strike the balance to move our economy forward. So with that, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.